see here on the right along the side of the Fraser River. And we'll be approaching the jail further up as we approach Port Coquitlam. So we'll uh, check back in with you then. It's Jason Wilcox signing out. Hi, it's Mark Emery calling from North Fraser pre-trial. And today is Friday, November 6th, and I'm hoping to get bail on that. I'm not sure of a title. If you can think of a good title uh, for the Prince of Pot memoirs, let me know. That would be interesting. Uh, but I'll be writing 100 chapters. That's my goal, to write 100 chapters. And a good example of one of them would be the Prince of Pot podcast number six called Remembrance Day. Because that's kind of like the flesh and blood writing I like to write about. Nothing bitter. I don't have any bitter memories. I have a lot of memories and great memories and lots of memories of all sorts of things. So like I was the youngest man in Canada to get a vasectomy when I was 19 because my girlfriend had a second trimester abortion when she was 17. And those are actually at westernstandard.ca. And that's an example of what a chat for my book would be like. Also, the Remembrance Day number six podcast. It's conversations with my father, conversations with patients, conversations with a fellow inmate, all about war and what they know, knew of war and what their experience was of war and how I interpreted that and what I've done about war in my lifetime. And so that's kind of how it'll be. You'll see the evolution of how Mark Emery got to be like he is, for better or worse, or however you think, based on all these things that go back to like when I was six months old, I can remember stuff so clearly and vividly. And there are a lot of them are funny stories that I think have kind of a universal uh, attraction because things like that happen to everybody but you know I just happen to be a good storyteller and I remember things nice and clearly and I um, didn't do anything truly heinous I did some stuff that was pretty weird right but nothing heinous. so I can kind of recall even my faults and flaws and things I did or even wish I hadn't have done and, and look back on it and see that it was all a learning experience and it all led me towards something good and what have you so I got a lot of those kind of stories it wouldn't really be about politics that much. Politics isn't really that interesting. But I think what happens to people is really interesting, what we learn from that, or what we think we learn from that. And also the funny universality of crazy things that happen to us, right? Stuff that you couldn't really make up and have people believe you. I got stories that blow your mind that are lovely, fun stories too, involving sex, drugs, misunderstandings, you know, my gun when I was a kid, I had a gun, I don't know what it was, but the 50s and 60s, but it was not uncool or uncommon for a 10 year old to own a rifle, I don't know why I had a rifle, right, how I saved someone's life, I've actually saved someone's life, and it's really cool, and I actually, like, had my arm break apart, and a really cool story, too, um, and so these things will all show up in my book, just little vignettes of my experience, uh, from when I was a paper boy, I started my first business when I was nine, called Stamp Treasure. And I talked about how I learned about how dishonest customers kill you in business at age 10. When, you know, in those days, you'd send stamps out in a book to people, and if they wanted to buy them, they'd take the stamps off your book and send the book back with the money that made up the difference, right? Except I realized, oh my God, I was disastrous if I, somebody didn't send the book back or the money and just decided to keep everything because I was trusting them. So that's when I realized I'm the trust were the factor in the equation here because they know where to get hold of me and I have a reputation I want to protect. So from now on, they send me the money first and I'll send them the product afterwards. Now, it's not odd that a 9, 10 year old is explaining this to my dad, but I was quickly evolving into a businessman. So when I was 11, I had a, a, a vintage comic book business called Mark's Comic Room, which was my bedroom downstairs, which was loaded with comic books. Eventually, 259 boxes, two, sorry, 256 boxes of comics packed full, all numbered and labeled in plastic bags by April 1975, and I sold that for $6,000 after paying myself hundreds of dollars a week in wages for a couple of years. And then I started my City Lights bookshop downtown in London, like in 1975 when I'm 17. And that was my career for the 17 years after that, right? So those are all fun stories about how such a kid got into business, why I'm fascinated with business. My parents all come from working class backgrounds, factory workers, every last one of them. Right, I'm the only businessman ever in our family. And, uh, and yeah, you know, it's funny story. My dad taught me how to count with money when I was four. Like, he'd make me count all my pennies in my penny piggy bank every day by year. All the ones from 1945, 23 of those, all the ones from 1946, 22 of those, all the ones. And then I'd have to stack them up in units of 10 and tell them how many units of 10 were, which was really good because that got me thinking kind of a decimal place. And then how many were in total in dollars? And what if it was broken up between three different people? And all these kind of crazy equations get me doing like uh, moving money around so that I just became very comfortable with money. And that money was like a mathematical tool that allowed you to do things like multiplication, division, all sorts of great things, right? But mostly getting more money to do more projects. 
Because eventually I would build models, models took money, I learned how to make gunpowder, so to buy saltpeter at the, at the pharmacy, big bags of it cost money, you know, I was reading all sorts of great things in grade 8. It's amazing, before the internet, you could still find valuable formula books and use bookshops that told you how to make gunpowder and stuff like that, right? So where I was making lots of gunpowder and explosives and stuff like that, kids wouldn't even know about that. If you went to buy an explosive, they would have you arrested and call you a terrorist or something crazy. Whereas me and my friends were making volatile substances all the time. It's amazing I still have my face. Because I remember, for example, we would buy, make, get rocket engines, but we wouldn't use the electronic launcher you're supposed to. We'd go up and put a match underneath the rocket engine, which would easily blow up in our face, right? And like totally crazy, stupid things, right? But we didn't die, and we didn't get maimed, so, you know, I learned a lot from all that sort of stuff, right? So... <laughs> a great fun time in the 60s.